I think we have the strongest of motives to pursue not only gene editing, but other forms of human enhancement. I'm Katrine Voller. This is the Practical Ethics Channel. I'm in London. I want to find out more about the ethics of gene editing in human embryos. Gene editing could allow us to prevent devastating genetic diseases in our future children. But what limits should we set to its use? Should parents be entirely free to choose the genetic characteristics of their children? Should we use gene editing not only to prevent disease, but also to enhance future people? Whom better to ask than Professor John Harris, who has been addressing these questions for decades, for example, in The Value of Life, Wonder Woman and Superman, Enhancing Evolution, and in his most recent How to Be Good, which focuses on moral enhancement. So let's get started. So what makes gene editing particularly controversial is that it will affect the germline, which means that any genetic changes made will be passed on to the embryo's offspring. Is it permissible to genetically modify whole generations without their consent? Well, the first thing to remind ourselves is how could we alter whole generations with their consent? They don't exist. There's nobody there to give the relevant consent. Given that gene editing in human embryos will affect future generations, should we have higher safety standards than for other assisted reproductive technologies? A lot of gene editing, certainly the first instances of gene editing, are going to be for therapeutic purposes. And if you can prevent a very serious illness by editing out the gene that would cause it, it wouldn't have to be so safe because the alternative is already uh, a bad alternative. Namely, if you don't make the edit, they're going to have a serious disease. So there is, as so often in these questions, no safe path. You have to decide which is more probable and which is more likely to be safe. Should prospective parents be free to choose the genetic characteristics of their children? So, for example, should deaf parents be allowed to gene edit their embryos so their child will be deaf? Or should, for example, uh, a white supremacist be allowed to gene edit an, an embryo to ensure that it will have, say, white skin, have blonde hair and blue eyes? Well, that's a, a very interesting question. But I think what parents should not be allowed to do is to harm their children. So the first question we have to ask is, would this genetic change be a harm to the individual change? Now, we don't tend to think that if someone has a bonny, bouncing, blue-eyed, blonde baby girl, that's a terrible tragedy. So I don't see why people shouldn't choose those types of characteristics, which are certainly not harmful and arguably beneficial in some circumstances. I don't see why they shouldn't be allowed to choose them. But what about, for example, prospective parents of, of color who want to genetically modify their embryos um, to give their children fair skin because they want to prevent them from having to deal with all the prejudices and discrimination people of color have to deal with? Well, again, one has to ask, why would it be wrongful for them to try, given the world as they expect it to be during their child's lifetime, why would it be wrong for them to take actions that protect their children from the harmful effects. I'm such a changed person, or rather I'm a different person than I might have been for precisely those sorts of reasons. Why? I'm a baby boomer. What does that mean? Well, I, in my case, it means I was born in 40, 1945. Why was I born in 1945? Because my Jewish parents, living in London, having had my sister in 1937, were not prepared to have another child that might grow up in a world which, in which Hitler won the war. So they didn't have the child that they might have had in 39 or 40 or 41. They waited, had a different child that they thought would have a better life. I don't think they acted wrongly. Of course, I would say that, wouldn't I? Because otherwise I wouldn't be here. I agree that there wouldn't be anything bad for the child itself, but wouldn't the parents become complicit in some way in discrimination in, in society against people of colour by giving in in some, in some sense? Well, uh, 
the therapy of choice might be to change society. But it's another thing to say that particular parents must impose that burden on their children in circumstances where a reasonable expectation might be these children would otherwise suffer. It's now, you asked me also about uh, deaf parents who might wish to have a deaf child so that it could share in deaf culture. Now to answer that question, we would need to think about whether or not deafness is a harm and whether parents should be entitled to inflict that harm on their children. Now, a lot of deaf parents don't think that it's a harm, but I think me certainly, and maybe you too, would think we had been harmed if we had been deafened. And if that is right, then I think it would be highly problematic for parents, deaf parents, deliberately to select a deaf child. That doesn't mean that they should should not be free to do so. And it's important here to distinguish what would be wrongful for them to do and what they should be prevented or coerced to ensure that it did not happen. So in the case of deaf parents, I think they would be wrong. And I've said so many times uh, publicly, but I don't think it should be unlawful. So should the state impose any restrictions on parents when it comes to gene editing their embryos? Absolutely, they should, uh, they should prevent serious harms. Now, um, the question is whether there are, um, as in the deaf case, reasons that are understandable, although, as I think, wrong-headed, why reproductive liberty, which is an important separate right, should not be protected even at the expense of some harm to children. If the state restricts the choices prospective parents can make, I mean, it seems that the state imposes its own values on society, and that seems problematic. Well, the state is always imposing its own model of what people should be. A democratic state imposes democratic values. It is reasonable for a state to take a view about what would be not only conducive to the welfare of their children, but what would be conducive to the welfare of the society as a whole. But it should be cautious in imposing that view. And my own view is that the, if we maximize the liberty of individual citizens, including their liberty in reproductive choice, that is the best method of combating totalitarianism, because the choices are likely to be as diverse as the people making them. Suppose we can safely gene edit embryos in a way that will reduce the child's impact on climate change, for example, by somewhat restricting um, its growth so that it needs less foods. So should parents do this? I don't rule out um, the wisdom or the liberty of parents to um, make genetic changes which will protect other things that we value like climate change. I'm very skeptical about this particular example because I think the impact of uh, body size, if that's what we're talking about, on climate is negligible. Human beings have a a certain range, it's not a great range in, in body size, in body mass, if you like. I think that, that it, those differences have such a minute effect, even collectively, that we would be better to influence climate change another way by reducing greenhouse gases and all that sort of thing. But do you think parents have moral reason to gene edit their embryos? In, in such a way for the good of others? But we do that all the time, I mean, not necessarily with gene editing, but think of vaccination. Why do we vaccinate our kids? Well, we vaccinate our kids partially to get the herd effect uh, that a, a disease like smallpox will disappear. And that is done for the public good as well as for the good of the individual children vaccinated. So I think the principles are the same. If we want the healthiest and happiest children shouldn't we just use a number of embryos with good genes and use stem cell technology to derive gametes from them so we can create lots of children from the same batch of genetically optimal embryos? Well, we could do that if we valued virtually at zero parental choice in the sorts of embryos that uh, they produced. 
And I think the consequences of doing that would be worse <laughs> than uh, would be disproportionate to the benefits that could be gained. The UK has strict regulations for the use of CRISPR technology in human embryos, but other jurisdictions in the world don't. So, first of all, should we have worldwide regulations and oversight for gene editing in human embryos, you think? And is there any point in a country like the UK imposing strict regulations if other countries will press ahead with the research regardless? Well, I don't know that it's the business of any particular country to ensure that other countries do not take a different view of the world any more than it's in the business of any individual person to ensure that other individuals uh, don't disagree with them. I actually think that world regulation is usually a bad idea. I'm very relieved, for example, that in Europe today the British are able to do embryo experimentation, which is illegal and criminalized in other countries. I think it conduces to human benefit that we do this research. But other countries are entitled to take a different view. If we impose always um, regulations universally, then we wouldn't have that variety and we wouldn't be able to learn from the differences that arise through it. In the UK, scientists are legally required to destroy the modified embryo after two weeks and many find the destruction of early embryos problematic. So do you think this is a good reason to block the research? No, not at all. Uh, I think there are many good reasons actually to extend the 14-day rule by a little bit at a time to see uh, how it goes. One has to remember that Nature is very, very destructive of human embryos. Uh, between only one in three and one in five conceptions ever survive to term. So we have to accept that nature or God, whoever is responsible, treats embryos as, um, as replaceable. And I think those who know what the embryo up to 14 days is like and looks like have good reasons for thinking that they are not doing wrong in experimenting and then destroying the resulting embryos after 14 days. If we could eliminate Down syndrome or deafness through gene editing, do you think we should? I think that um, if it is plausible to believe that either Down syndrome or deafness, or both of them, um, are disabilities, that it is rational to prefer not to be deaf and rational to prefer not to have the uh, symptomatology of Downs, then uh, I think it is reasonable for parents to select against that if they choose. But again, to say that is not to say that Downs uh, babies or deaf babies should not be born and should be prevented from being born. I would leave those choices, although I disagree with the people who make those choices, I would leave those choices to the parents. So what if gene editing went so far over several generations that we were no longer human? Should we try to stop that from happening? <laughs> Look, um, it is an interesting question and it depends what you think being no longer human means. So we know that we descended from apes about seven plus million years ago in Africa. Uh, if those apes had all got together on the plains of uh, Africa and said, listen guys, simian nature, fantastic thing. We really have to be careful that we don't lose it. You and I would not be having this interesting conversation today. And I'm sure that our non-human descendants, who are hopefully inevitable, because I hope that sentient beings continue to thrive either on this planet or another one. Uh, we will have these descendants and I'm sure they will be pleased to be alive. And since I will have been long since dead, I promise you will never hear me complain about that eventuality. So do you think that therefore we actually have strong reason to pursue gene editing? I think we have the strongest of motives to pursue not only gene editing, but other forms of human enhancement. Let me offer you two truths about the future, which are as true as truths about the future can ever be. 
The first of those truths is that in the future there will be no more human beings. And the second is that in the future there will be no more planet Earth. Why? Well, because either we will have wiped ourselves out as humans by our own stupidity and recklessness, or we will have further evolved over time into what will be recognizably a different species. But in order for that species to have somewhere to live, it will have to find a different planet because we know that this planet eventually must die. The sun will make it uninhabitable by creatures like us. Initially, uh, that was thought to be seven and a half billion years off, and that calculation is Stephen Hawking's. But Stephen Hawking has recently revised his calculation, and he said recently that he thinks we would be lucky to survive another thousand years without finding either a new planet on which to live or, uh, as I would say also, without developing the possibilities of creating a new planet. I hope that creatures like us, who value life, take delight in it, and take delight in the creation of others who will be better capable of enjoying life and their lives, creatures like us continue to survive. To do so, we will have to change. I think we have to be very careful not to preempt the changes that might enable that survival.